Good morning. It's Tuesday of the summit. It's also election day. If you haven't voted, please do. What is it, early and often? Is that what they say in Chicago? It looks like a few of our compatriots uh, are out voting right now because we have a sparse crowd this morning, but I'm sure it's going to fill up in the next few minutes. Okay, here is our Net Hope trivia for the morning. Who can name the seven founding members of Net Hope? Or can you name one of them? Harada. <laughs> Save the children, that's one. Catholic Relief Services. Winrock, good job. World Vision. Mm, I don't know. I'll turn it in a second, but I don't think it was Nature Conservancy. Any other guesses? Mercy Corps, Children's International. Okay, I'll, I'll give you the answers. There you can see it. Children's International, CARE. Did anybody say CARE? CRS, Save the Children, Mercy Corps. So thanks to those seven who had the vision and who hung in there as the rest of us joined them. want to thank our breakfast sponsor this morning, IPA. Um, we appreciate that. I hope you all got enough to eat. If not, I know there's still more out there. Here are the items of note on today's agenda. Uh, first of all, it is Election Day in the USA, and I'm sure we'll be hearing about that. I don't think the news coverage, uh, how can I say that? The news coverage has been going on for months and months, but the news coverage of the actual results will start this evening. Um, the Technology Solutions Exhibit continues all day today. Please take time to um, visit our sponsors. Remember that Planson in Marset will be doing their demos during the coffee break this morning and this afternoon out on the patio. Member Showcase is going to happen today. And so just to warn you, at the end of this morning's speakers, right before we go to break, we're going to split this room into four sections, and that will tell you the group that you're going to travel with through the member showcase today. So please um, stay tuned for that. Don't go to break until you know which group you're in. Uh, the lunch tech talks are today that you will see some tables in the dining room with topics on them. Feel free to find a topic that you'd like to sit and talk about and eat your lunch with that group. The member member sessions start today. If you are part of a member organization, please look on the online agenda. You will see which um, member to member session your organization has been assigned to. Um, please uh, follow those directions. At the same time that's going on, the corporate roundtable will be going on for all of the non-member organizations. Today, the annual membership meeting happens this afternoon. If you are part of a member organization, you are more than welcome to attend that. We'll be voting on new member and um, a variety of other interesting information will be presented. Wanted to call out that the Microsoft Tech team will have quite a presence here on Thursday and Friday and be presenting a number of sessions, so you'll be wanting to look forward to that and see which of those sessions you want to participate in. Birds of a Feather dinners happen tonight. Look on the schedule, see which ones you'd like to attend. And then our happy hour will be hosted by Aperio tonight. Um, everybody will get a drink ticket, and you will need to be in the closing session remarks to get that ticket on your way out the door. So make sure you show up <laughs> to see me at the end of the day today. And that's it for this morning. I'm excited to get started here. I'm going to invite um, Frank Scott to the stage to introduce our first speaker. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mary Snap. Um, Mary is Corporate Vice President for uh, Microsoft. She heads uh, Microsoft uh, Philanthropies. Uh, she's been with Microsoft almost 30 years um, and is, has the notable distinction of being the first female attorney at Microsoft. So on, on a day where we may vote a first female president, that's <laughs> sort of significant. Um, Microsoft, is, as most of you know, has done a lot for NetHope members over the years. Um, uh, in the last 12 years, Microsoft has donated over $75 million worth of software to NetHope members. 
Um, Microsoft has also supported the Office 365 nonprofit program. Microsoft has supported us in pretty much every disaster response effort um, over the years, and most notably, uh, quite a bit of support for our work with Syrian refugee crisis, uh, including our crisis informatics work. Um, Microsoft was a big supporter of the NetHope Academy back in the day, and their contributions are still making a difference in the NetHope Academies around the world. And I believe Microsoft has sponsored, uh, as a title sponsor, the NetHope Summit for the last six years or seven years. And so they're the title sponsor again this year, and this conference would not be possible without their support. Um, so please. Join me in giving a welcome to Mary Snap. Good morning, everybody. It's great to see so many of you here today. And I'm really glad that I am talking to you at 8 AM rather than at 8 PM, because I'm sure I would have very few people in the room at that hour, um, given everything that's happening today. Um, but I did want to tell you how how happy I am to be here with you, with so many NGOs who really understand the importance of the work that we are doing broadly to ensure that we can bring the right technology to NGOs, to create the digital NGOs that can really make a difference in solving some of the world's critical problems. So I know why you're here, and you might be wondering why I'm here. Uh, given that 30-year background as a lawyer. Um, and I would say uh, my husband wonders the same thing most of the time. Um, about a year or so ago, when Brad Smith, our president, asked me to take the role, I went home. Um, it was over a Labor Day weekend. I went home, and I talked to my husband about it. And he said, that is just so great. You can just sit back in your office and people will come to you, they'll be nice, they'll ask you for money, and it'll be great. The job is hardly that, as you all know. Uh, it's hardly that. It is lots of new things, it's networking in new ways, it's learning new skills, it's learning um, new issues. And while I love that time being a lawyer, after about the 1,000th indemnification agreement, negotiation, and after the analysis of the Herfindahl Index for antitrust law for the however many time we did an acquisition, and no matter how many times I looked at that secondary liability for copyright law, I knew that there was something else that was really calling me that would really be a lifelong passion, that would really be the job that I cared the most about, and this is it. So I'm happy to be here today to talk with you. And I'm also thrilled to talk about this particular point in time, because we are at an era where lots of things are changing, and they're changing very, very rapidly. And in fact, you might say, clicker? No clicker at all. OK, circle. Ah, is this going to be 10 seconds each time? This is going to be a real, OK. OK, hold on. And we've got a 10 second delay here for each one. OK, we'll, s OK. All right, we'll work through it. Um, we are at the dawn of what is called the fourth industrial revolution. And with this comes lots and lots of new technology. But frankly, in each case, we see some resistance. And we see a resorting in the marketplace. And I think that's what we will see today with what is called, essentially, the digital revolution. And so one of the things to look at to understand what's going to happen, however, it's going to happen at a rate probably of uh, 10 times uh, as fast and 300 times the scale as this first industrial revolution. So if you think about this period of time, it was a time when we understood combustion engines and steam engines. And it was the first time where an engine could go faster than a horse. And with this advancement forward, 
at the same time, we also saw lots of resistance, lots of disruption. If you think about social change at that time, it was the Civil War. It was abolition. And the technology and the industry came together as well because the advancement not only was the combustion engine, but on the social sphere, the advancement was photography so that you had the ability to see images like this and it enabled communication in many different kinds of ways. So then if you think about what the second industrial revolution would bring, this is an era where we thought about electricity. And with respect to electricity, we also saw radio coming forward. And again, with the second industrial revolution and radio, you also saw some disruption. We had the abolition of slavery. We had the beginnings of women's rights. Women had the right to vote. But at the same time, on the other side of that, we had things like the Immigration Act of 1924, which really closed down the ability of many Asians to come to the United States. We saw temperance, which um, a crazy thing, if you really think about it, the abolition of alcohol as a constitutional amendment in the United States. And you might think that's just a crazy thing, but there are many who think that that was, in fact, a reaction to immigration, primarily from Europe. So again, you see that notion of resistance. As we head into the, oh good, it's going faster. The third industrial revolution, the PC industrial revolution. And this, you know, many of us uh, were part of. The first time that we saw PCs on every desk and in every home. And it really brought together the ability to be productive and it also brought together the ability for consumers to do things in a much more efficient way. A lot of shopping online, a lot of learning information online that didn't exist before. But at the same time, in this period, we had a lot of movement in the civil rights area, both for African American and Latinos, continued for women's rights, gay and lesbian rights. And so again, you see a lot of this push forward on the, on the technology side. And you see the push forward in terms of social moving forward, and also resistance as well. So in this era, we had television bringing us along with the, with the technology and the communications, and again, making it easier for people to see what was happening around the world. And so today, as we think about the fourth industrial revolution, we see some of the same things we think that will happen. We'll see technology moving forward. We will see social media in the sense of um, much more online. We have the Twitter, we have the Snapchat, we have other kinds of things. And the question is, what sorts of resistance and how will we overcome it to ensure that we're able to do all the things that we need to do? So as we think about the fourth industrial revolution, we can see three primary areas of growth. The first area of growth is physical. And a lot of you are experiencing some of this today. And you'll see robotics. You'll see things like 3D printing and new materials that really will add to the work that you'll be able to do more effectively as digital NGOs. The second area, as you think about it, is biological. And the things that we will be able to do to use big data to solve problems in the area of medical, biological, and genetics, the promise of that is really, really astounding. And then a third area, I would argue, is the digital age, the one that you are most familiar with, the Internet of Things, blockchain. And with that, we know that we will see disruptive business models. So we have the ability, with this fourth industrial revolution, to use data to solve problems that heretofore had never been able to be solved. And as we think about this, the first area of resistance that I think many of you probably experience, I certainly do when I talk about big data. Uh, I'll just give you an example. I, uh, uh, about six or so months ago, I was talking to a group of people, mostly social entrepreneurs, some nonprofits, about big data and the fourth industrial revolution. 
Um, I should also say that these were largely millennials. Um, so anyway, I finished the speech. I went to the back of the room, honestly, just to find something to eat, because it was about 1 o'clock, and I hadn't had, had anything to eat that day. And I just happened to sit behind a pole. Um, the room was filled. I'm sure they thought I left the room. The first speaker came up to the stage, and he said, I don't know about that Microsoft. You know, they talk about big data, but nobody can measure how many hugs a child needs. And he was right. He was right. And we have to think about this industrial revolution with the resistance, the resistance, frankly, to technology and to big data. And we also have to think about balancing the challenges that will come about as a result of the fourth industrial revolution. Here are just a few of them. Traditional jobs. If you think about it, uh, the kinds of jobs that will be automated will be a number of jobs that will have typically, typically gone to people who may not have a four-year college degree, may not have a two-year college degree. In the last 25 years, the Department of Commerce has done a study identifying jobs available compared to now versus 25 years ago. The number of jobs that are available in the United States to people with a four-year college degree has doubled in 25 years, doubled. The number of jobs available for people with a two-year degree has grown by 50%. The number of jobs available for people who have a high school degree or a GED has actually declined by about 13%. So we know that there will be disruption. We know that there will be traditional jobs that will disappear. I actually, you know, it's, we, it, it's election day, but it's also coming up on Thanksgiving. And I make my annual um, pilgrimage to the Midwest, um, where I grew up to see family. And I live, grew up in this little town of about 10,000 people or so in Kansas. And there's one place to eat the night before Thanksgiving because everything else is closed and everything else, everybody's cooking. You know, the few family restaurants are shut down. The only place to eat is Applebee's. And every year we go to Applebee's the night before. And every year, but last year, some really um, fresh looking, you know, 18 or 19 year old um, young person greeted us at the door and made sure we got to our seats. Last year that didn't happen. Nobody at the door. A computer was at the door. And you found your table on the computer, and you went to your table, and you ordered your meal. And the only time you saw a person was when your food was actually delivered. You also paid at the table. That's a, that's a, a great job for a young person who's just trying to figure out what to do that's now gone. So we really need to think about what this means in terms of traditional jobs. Privacy is another significant area. As we think about data, how do we manage the implications for privacy for consumers? How do we manage the implications of security for questions related to government access to data and government essentially surveillance of information? And we've had a lot of news about that in the last couple of years. Inequality. We know that there is a world where we have people with means and people with not. And how do we ensure that in this era we actually address the issues of inequality rather than making them even more significant and dramatic than they are today. And accessibility. I would argue that in this time period, people with disabilities and the demands, frankly, well justified and needs that they have, are a civil rights movement in itself. So as we think about this fourth industrial revolution, we see tremendous opportunities. But at the same time, I'd argue that the resistance is some of the things that we've been seeing in the United States, in the UK, and around the world. We have a tendency in this era, we've had the rise of the religious right, the Tea Party, and nativism. This fear that some people want to look backwards, inwards, and downwards. And how do we ensure that we take the technology forward we bring the promise of the technology and not leave anyone behind. And that is the challenge ahead of us now. Now, one of the ways that we can think about how this might unfold is, again, looking a little bit at the past. Uh, this is a photograph, remember, from that first um, communications era. 
uh, photography. Um, this is a photograph of a corner on Broadway, the famous Flatiron Building, right around the turn of the century. And you can see that it is primarily populated by, um, in terms of, of travel, by horses. Horses with horse-drawn buggies, horse, horses drawing large groups of people, buses, and goods. And just 20 years later, you see the same street corner, not a horse to be seen, and you see the rise of the automobile. Now, what happens in that time period? Certainly, jobs are disrupted. The people who worked on things like driving the horses, the stablers, the people who shod the horses, all of those kinds of jobs have given way to other jobs in this era. And if you think about how fast this changes, I think about it in just in terms of my, um, um, my family and generational kinds of things. In 1900, one quarter of the agricultural production of the United States went to feed horses. That's a, that's a pretty big significant in terms of agriculture. And I think about my grandfather growing up on a very small farm in the middle of the Depression Within the second industrial revolution, only the radio, really, as his outside communication to the world. He sold that for him, and of course, he sold it to a very large agricultural um, enterprise. We then have moved to the next era of that, where we're thinking about agriculture and the things and the promise of agriculture in new and different ways, hydroponic farming. We're thinking about farming on rooftops uh, on the top of high rises. And all of a sudden, it's very cool to be in the future farmers of America again. Uh, and the ways in which farming in Africa is really, really starting to change. So you think about how agriculture has moved over this period of time. And you could pick other industries and do the same. So again, the question is, how do we ensure that there is the promise of the growth in technology and the ability of people to move forward in this fourth industrial revolution? How do we ensure that the same, the people, that the income inequality actually narrows and not widens? How do we ensure that racial disparity narrows and not widens? How do we ensure that the capacity of nonprofit organizations to meet the needs of these fourth industrial revolution modern times grows? These are the questions that, frankly, we don't know the answers to. We don't know all the answers to them. We don't even, frankly, know all of the questions. But we do know that it's only working together with your organizations and with NetHope that we have even a chance of starting to sort out some of these issues. So if we think about these kinds of things, one of the things I'd propose to you is that it might be time to think about creating a cloud for a broader good. And a couple of months ago, Microsoft published a, a book. Actually, there's a limited edition, 1,000 hard copies, but you all can find the digital one on the website. Um, and you just search for cloud for global good. And it lays out a set of frameworks that really seek to actually just ask the questions and ask all of us to come together to say, are these the right questions? And how do we begin to think about what the answers will be in this period of time? So as we think about a cloud for global good, we think about it in several different ways. A trusted cloud, a responsible cloud, and an inclusive cloud. The trusted cloud is really, how do we ensure that the cloud is secure? How do we ensure that we are uh, abiding by people's privacy rights? How do we ensure that we are managing cybersecurity and hacking kinds of issues? How do we ensure that we are managing government access and managing government surveillance? And you may know that uh, Microsoft has actually sued the United States government twice in the past year to uh, essentially um, prevent the government from getting access to consumer and business information of our customers that resides in Ireland. Lots of issues there related to the flow of data across, and lots of issues related to whose data it really is. 
it's our point of view that this is our consumer's data, and it's not ours to turn over. And from our perspective, the same rights that people have and businesses have in the physical world should translate into the digital world. I suspect that case is going to the Supreme Court. So these issues of trusted cloud are very important. Second area is responsible cloud. And here, there are lots of issues related to sustainability, because as I don't have to tell you, the cloud is not really a cloud. It's, it's major infrastructure buildings with servers that take a lot of electricity, uh, that take a lot of cooling power, and we need to ensure, for example, that the carbon footprint of our cloud is as efficient and effective as it can possibly be. And we're hard at work on that. The area that I do want to talk about, though, is the inclusive cloud, because that's the one that we together will think about as we go forward. How do we ensure that the cloud is inclusive for all? And as we think about the inclusive cloud, we could talk about lots of things, but I think in terms of you all, the digital NGOs, there's probably three imperatives that I would call out. And you might have others, but three primary imperatives. The first one is affordable and reliable access. We need to ensure that everyone has access to the internet. And today, we know that just under half of the world does not have access to the internet, and that this is very spotty. There are places like Korea and Saudi Arabia where we're at about 100% in terms of the people who have access, and in other places like Sub-Saharan Africa where the numbers are down around 2 to 5% of people who have access. So it's hard to really think about inclusion if we're not also talking about, from the very beginning, access to the internet. A second primary area, let's see where the slide's going to go here, digital literacy. We all know that if we're going to take advantage of the cloud, that the use of technology will change, and that it will be important for everyone to have some level of digital literacy. Just the other day, I actually yesterday on the, on the flight over, I was reading an article about uh, the, the, the coming of autonomous cars and driverless vehicles. And the article was quoting a cab driver who used to be a steel mill worker, got laid off there as robotics came, driving a cab. And he was thinking about what happens next. And he said, you know, I've become more digitally literate. My cab has a tablet. My cab has GPS. My cab has uh, a processing, credit processing machine. I've become more literate. But he was thinking about whether or not he would be laid off as a cab driver. And he said something that, you know, one of those simple things that is, is so profound. He said, change is inevitable. That's life on Earth. And so we think about digital literacy and the importance of how we ensure that we bring everyone along. I recently was, um, made a trip to Morocco. And in that trip, I actually took advantage of an offer from Mercy Corps and went to see a juvenile detention facility. And I went there because they were starting a pilot program in order to teach uh, digital inmates some basic level of computer literacy. I walked in, and I looked at a few of the computers. And at the same time as I was looking at them, some of them had not been unwrapped from the packaging, by the way, but so this really, truly was a pilot. They said, well, 40% of the population of Morocco is illiterate, can't read. And as we went in the door, and they were telling us about the advances being made in the prison, I realized that they were talking about moving things to computers, not, on, not in the cloud, but even to computers. And they were still logging in and out prisoners on ledgers that literally were this big on paper. But at the same time, I think it's possible to think about digital literacy without necessarily thinking that you have some of the verbal literacy. There are ways to learn skills and ways to learn literacy that on the digital world that we still can hope to enable people to have jobs. And so when we think about digital literacy, 
It is for areas of the world like this. Quite frankly, it is also in the United States and elsewhere around the world an area where we'd really love to reach young girls. Because as you all know, this is an area where young girls are um, right about that age of ninth grade thinking that math and science and computers aren't so cool as they might have when they were seven and eight years old. And it's important to keep young girls engaged and involved, and in those areas where the rights of women have not advanced as much as they have in the United States. Ways in which we can have young women and women learning entrepreneurial skills and even working from their home if need be. I actually, I know you all have all of these great stories too, but I met a woman um, recently from Kenya. And she um, um, essentially was, a, was an entrepreneur. Her story was that she had been married, her husband died unexpectedly, and even though the laws of uh, Kenya enabled uh, women to have half of the property at the time of, uh, of death, Culturally, that never happened. And she was in a rural area, and so his family took all the property. They left her with a single cow. And she looked at the cow, and she decided that this cow was an asset that she would use. This was her productive asset. And as she started this small business of uh, providing milk locally in this rural village, she also had the beginnings of an idea as a social entrepreneur. And she started in this country a micro-leasing program. And with the micro-leasing program, essentially, she enabled other women to have an asset. It might be a hairdryer. It might be a baker's mill. It might be a lawnmower. And she leased the asset to them. And as they made payments on it, as the lease finished, then they acquired title to it. So it was an entrepreneurial idea for micro-leasing involving some amount of digital literacy, actually, but not necessarily literacy. And so we need to really open our minds to think about ways in which we can use digital literacy and the importance of digital literacy as we go forward with the fourth industrial revolution. So then as we think about a third area, I think about this as sort of next generation skills. And with next generation skills, we need to really think about what are the IT skills, what are the IT trainings that we can provide people, not young people, yes, but also people who potentially are in their 30s who are thinking about what their next job is, the disruption side of what that next job is. And so this next generation skills will be important for all of us as we go forward. Um, I recently was talking to Meg Garlinghouse. Some of you might know her as the, as the um, uh, lead of LinkedIn Philanthropies program. She says that right now they're thinking about the shelf life of technology skills and technology jobs to be about seven or eight years. So if you think about that, it is really important to have IT skills training and updates to IT skills training provided. That might be by nonprofits, it might be by corporations, it might be by businesses and universities, but it will be important. And at the same time, with those sort of hard skills, IT training skills, it will be important to think about what are the soft skills and the cultural skills that will be needed to take advantage of this. Many universities are starting to think about this in a, in a very serious way. I actually last week was on the campus at the University of Michigan listening to the, professor, or the president talk about how they are training university students in a different way. And basically he said that most university students are taught not to be risk takers. They're taught really to think about what their GPA is, what their G, whatever the GRE thing is, what the LSAT is, and they are optimizing for getting that one score. And so they don't want to risk failure. They don't want to risk that kind of iterative learning that comes from failure. So they are really thinking about ways to grade for collaboration, providing content in a, in a digital form, 
and having all the classwork be focused on teamwork, collaboration, uh, understanding real world, real, real world situations. So no more multiple choice questions in those math and science classes. But instead, they're thinking about putting a problem out for students to solve, whether it's a quiz or whether it's a large project. So these next gen skills of providing sort of a lifelong learning IT training, but also the growth mindset that allows people to work in teams, to take risks, to learn ways of computational thinking, which are truly analytical thinking, will be really important as we think about what, how we move people forward to this next generation. So in terms of that, let me tell you just a little bit about Microsoft's commitment, which we share with all of you. Frank talked a little bit about the technology commitment that Microsoft has made to NetHope and the member organizations. And we will continue that strong investment in our technology. And as you know, our software donation and sales program has been a hallmark of the work that we've done broadly for nonprofits. But it's also most important for organizations like you, where we really want to go deep with our technology to see how you can use it, how it can be adapted, and how we make the world a better place. Certainly, our cash grants will continue to be important. And we know that those are the easiest things for nonprofits to absorb. And we know that it is important going forward. And that will continue to be part of the work that we do. But I, let me tell you about a couple other areas that are relatively new for us to think about. The first is um, our own employees, the people. We have largely a skilled workforce. So for us, the question is, how do we take our employees' time and, and increase the volunteering and the, actually the large legacy of that that we already do and turn that into more of a skills-based volunteering program? Last year, Microsoft's um, uh, employees in the United States volunteered 540,000 hours of volunteer time. We know that because the company matches that time, uh, $25 an hour, up to $15,000 a year. So our employees, we encourage them to log their time as they volunteer. What we don't know is how much of that time is skills-based. And so in this last year, we have started to experiment with things like our hackathons. Last summer, over a three-day period, we had um, over 1,000 employees volunteer for 300 Hacks for Good, where they identified the hack that they wanted to work on. And in 40 of those cases, we actually brought in nonprofits to pitch to our employees a problem that they wanted to solve. And our employees then essentially interviewed for the job for a three-day period to work on this hack. So we're experimenting with these kinds of things. We're experimenting with things like micro-volunteering, where we have a 90-minute project over the noon hour to, for example, wipe a PC clean to get it out to a great nonprofit organization that could use it. And we're experimenting with going deep with four or five organizations where we would have a team of Microsoft volunteers over a period of two or three months working on a problem. This is a difficult thing to do, as you all know. It's hard to ingest a volunteer and do it right and have expectations met on both sides in that period of time. But we think it's absolutely critical to being able to leverage the work we do. We all know that uh, licensing software is one thing, and deploying and actually utilizing software well is another thing. And we're exploring whether or not we can use our own employees to ensure that some of the utilization and consumption increases. We're also really open to ideas from you on how we might do a better job of that by using your skills, by using other third parties, or by using other for-profit organizations, because this is one of the gaps, I think, that we really need to address. The fourth area that you may not think about so much with a, non, uh, with a nonprofit, but you could with us, is the area of advocacy. 
We are not a separate foundation. We are part of Microsoft. And as a result, that enables us to integrate. I think it's really great. We integrate a lot better with the business. We can call on the business when we need things. We can take feedback from the business. We can look at product roadmaps in a different way. All of that is great. One of the things I think is particularly useful about it is that we don't have to be shy about advocating. So if we want to advocate for education reform, which we do, we can. If we want to advocate for immigration reform, which we do, we can. And if we want to tie that government affairs advocacy with some of the nonprofit work that we do with you, we can. So for example, in the education area, We've, over the last several years, been engaged in the United States on a program called Make It Count. With Make It Count, uh, we are going state by state to legislatures to ensure that a computer science class taught in high school counts towards a math or a science credit uh, needed for graduation. And when we started this about five years ago, only 17 states counted computer science towards graduation requirements in math or science. It was, uh, it was viewed as an elective uh, in all the other states. Today, we're at about 30 states, and we are going state by state. Our government affairs team has a, a, a goal this year of putting 10 more on that list, and we are using programs like our YouthSpark program, working with nonprofits like the Boys and Girls Club, the Girl Scouts, um, to a city year to show legislators what can happen when young people get excited about technology. So these kinds of advocacy programs will continue to be important to us. Frankly, social good marketing will continue to be important to us. And maybe the most prominent example you saw recently was uh, the Upgrade Your World campaign that we ran for Windows 10, where each month for a year we highlighted a different nonprofit using Microsoft technology and we highlighted the great work that the nonprofit was doing. Worldwide, uh, Pencils of Promise was a great example of one, and the Malala Fund and others. The interesting thing about this is that we actually used a form of crowdsourcing to identify which of the nonprofits we were going to highlight. So it, it enabled us to really um, um, experiment with social media at the same time as highlighting our technology and highlighting the great work of our nonprofits. So as we then think about that, where do we focus our time? We focus uh, a lot on, again, the notion of inclusion, how we ensure that no one is left behind. And here are the four areas that we've really targeted and highlighted. The first is, is nonprofits. Um, we actually have touched about 400,000 nonprofits with our software. But in terms of depth work, there are about 200 nonprofits that we work with on a sustained and a persistent basis around the world in about 55 countries to deliver the kinds of technology and the kinds of sustained both operating cash support and technology support that we think will enable you all to change the world. A second area for us, growing area, I'd say it's really nascent is uh, addressing the needs of people with disabilities. Might surprise you to know that there are about one billion people in the world who identify as having a disability. And these people are primarily uh, people who are least served by technology and have not been able to participate equally in any of the industrial revolutions as we go forward. But as we think about technology and assistive technology, the ways in which we can start to address the needs that this community tells us they have are very important. In the United States, someone with a graduate degree with an identified and visible disability is much more likely to be poor, is much more likely to be unemployed, their family is much more likely to be living in the poverty line, and that individual is probably, with that graduate degree, making less money than someone with only a high school education. So if we can find ways to make technology accessible to this group, we know that we will be doing really, really good work. And the promise of technology 
both at a macro level and at the micro level with assistive technology is just enormous. We are working very closely with our corporate and social responsibility folks. This is an area where we lead, need lots of feedback. I mean, it, it's not something that engineers have typically done in terms of thinking about inclusive design. So getting feedback from all of you um, and from the community is really important. Most of you know that we've been involved with youth for a, quite a long time with programs like Youth Spark, reaching uh, in 55 countries with programs to drive digital literacy, everything from an hour of code, uh, which is coming up in December, all the way through to more advanced programs in terms of computational thinking and computer science. And we do ask our nonprofits to really reach girls and communities that have been underserved, however that might be defined in that particular area. And we'll continue that work. It will be absolutely critical to continue that work. And then a final area where many of you work and where we all know that the needs are more critical for displaced people than ever before is humanitarian aid for this community. Uh, we know that there are 65 million displaced persons in the world today. We know that those numbers are going to get higher. And we know that we have urgent need right now in Europe. Um, we have been responding to that need, both from our own government, from other governments, and from you. And in the last six months, have contributed about $20 million, a combination of cash and technology, to organizations like NetHope, like Mercy Corps, like CARE, and others to really address the needs of displaced people. As we've done this work, we realize that um, we're asked to put uh, digital literacy programs in community centers, like in Germany and in camps, but we're also exploring ways in which gaming technology can be used to reduce the levels of stress and, in effect, to provide psychosocial learning so that people can be in a place where they're able and willing and can access the kinds of digital literacy and digital programming uh, that's needed. A lot of the work in this area first began in Kosovo, and so we're working with some of the international organizations there to think about what kinds of programs might be useful. So those are the four areas of inclusion for us. And as I think about essentially um, what comes next, go back, ah, now what did I do? Okay, imagine you're seeing the thing that says slide 19. I can't, I can't. Let me just, there we go. Partnership. We, no way do we have all the answers. No way can we do this alone. This industrial revolution is inevitable, as that taxi driver said. And uh, it is coming at an amazing rate and speed. And at the same time, you know, I've been talking about both uh, uh, communication gains and social resistance. This is a time when there is a lot of anxiety and essentially stress in the system. Um, in that trip uh, to Morocco, as I was driving out to the prison, we went through small villages and uh, very, very impoverished looking buildings and apartments. Every single one of them had a satellite dish. They know that things are coming, that things are going to change. And at the same time, in the United States, there's lots being written today about unhappiness with people who have been poor for a long time and um, have a high level of anger. I, some of my team knows this. I recently finished this book, Hillbilly Elegy, where a guy talks about growing up in Appalachia and getting out, and he talks about what life is like for people who are still there. And the level of anger and despair and discouragement so we need to be able to work together to get past the anxiety, to use the technology, to use the communication tools, and to do it together, to ask the right question, and to start to build the answer so that we have a world in which 
no one is left behind. And as we think about what that might look like, and I think about some of the travels, I think it's important to, you know, we've talked about infrastructure. I'm going to go back to infrastructure a little bit. We shouldn't be building walls. We need to be building bridges. And the partnership with you, the digital NGOs, Microsoft and other for-profits, government, together we need to build bridges to ensure that the fourth industrial revolution brings all the promise that it can from a technological standpoint and that we leave no one behind. And we look forward to our work with you in that regard. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mary. Um, there's a few other Microsoft people here, and they often tell me this is a great opportunity for them to learn uh, from all of you. So could I ask the Microsoft people, Jane and James and Justin and Cameron, and to stand up uh, so you all can kind of get a sense for... So they're around all week. They're around all week, and then on Thursday, there are some technical experts, I think something like eight or 10 uh, super technical experts on Office 365 and Azure and Dynamics coming for some of the breakout sessions. So if you haven't uh, circled that on your agenda, please, uh, please do so. Um, yesterday, uh, Lauren uh, spoke uh, quite eloquently about the digital NGO. And our next um, speaker, I think, probably will, will amplify that, but with a, with a particular focus on data. Uh, Bill Hoffman is the Associate Director for the World Economic Forum. Uh, he leads their data-driven development initiative, and I think you'll find his remarks uh, quite interesting. Bill? Thank you, everyone. And uh, first, uh, let's uh, have another round of, 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 excuse me, of applause for Mary. I thought that was just a fantastic speech. And, uh, yeah, nothing like following the people that invented PowerPoint, right? So, <laughs> great stuff. And the other thing I'd like to do before I get started, too, is an acknowledgement to NetHope. Uh, part of my job, I'm spoiled. I get to go to a lot of meetings and events like that and interact with some fantastic people and looking forward as far as, well, what's the world that we can build? And I think when you look at the community of people from public sector, private sector, policymakers, when you look at the knowledge, the insights, the work that comes out of this community, and most importantly, the impact, right? You know, we all get a lot of emails, but every once in a while, sadly, but most importantly, when, when crises hit, there's a message from NetHope. And I think that's so important that this group not only has great vision, a great community that delivers impact, it's, it's remarkable. And so this is a broad statement just to acknowledge everybody here and the great work that NetHope's doing. Um, I'll probably talk for a few more minutes, but if there's one, home, one thing to take away, it's how great that this whole group is and just much con continued success. What I'd like to do, to do today is also to share just a little bit of work that we've been doing uh, at the World Economic Forum on, as Mary noted, the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Uh, it's a framing concept that the forum's been advancing for a while uh, so that can, people can more effectively understand the transition, the changes that are happening uh, in more relevant ways. Then I'd also like to spend a little bit of time looking at, well, what are some of the ways that businesses are looking at the technological change, we call it the digital transformation, but what are some pragmatic and practical things that we might share and learn from uh, that businesses are looking at, and hopefully that might apply into the NGO community as well. And then lastly, I'd like to dive into some of the work that we've been doing in the data. And maybe this is the part of the talk that might get a little focused, a little granular, um, but it's a space that we've been at uh, for a number of years in collaboration. Actually, NetHope was one of the first uh, organizations to help us frame some of the topics here, you know, roughly five, six years ago. Um, but there's some insights, there's some value. I think there's things that hopefully you might be able to walk through uh, that will hopefully lead to a more constructive conversation. You know, one thing I think we're all tired of is when we're talking past one another, waving our hands, speaking in vague generalities, 
but you're not really sure what to do next. And so hopefully there might be a few thoughts, ideas that can help frame what you do in this thing that we call data. Um, real quickly, just a little bit of background about the World Economic Forum and the work that we're doing. Uh, we're a convener at one level, and we've been at that space for oh, well over 40 years now, uh, bringing together public sector, private sector, um, government, individuals, and most importantly, civil society and NGOs. And so just as an institution, just one thing I wanted to share was just that we have roughly well over 100 NGOs, a number of faith-based organizations, labor organizations, um, civil society organizations that are all coalescing as a community. And uh, please feel free to reach out to me to figure out how, if you'd like to, to join either as a NetHope member or individually in this community. Um, not only does this community work together to share and link ideas within themselves, but they also build bridges into the private sector conversation, uh, into some of the regional issues. And so I think just in terms of a voice, if there's a shared agenda, that we're a platform that can be used to advance some of those issues. Um, we also do relatively interesting work, too, just in terms of framing issues. Uh, the notion that was addressed before around employment. Uh, what can we do around some of the issues related to just the, the overall tensions and anxieties, uh, climate, gender? There's a variety of issues where the voice of civil society and NGOs is foundational. And so that's another area that you can engage. And lastly, it's around impact. Uh, we've just announced a few weeks ago of setting up some what we're calling innovation labs, some ways that we can actually find a few examples, start to build out, collaborate, and come up with some pilots, some use cases, some ways that we could collectively go forward uh, in conjunction with other impact organizations like yourselves that have you know, a real challenge that they want to get to work on. And so in that regard, it's less about the talking and more about the doing. And so just institutionally, we're also starting to really focus on, well, what are some pilots, some ways we can bring the, the practices into uh, life? Um, also want to thank Mary for the great framing of the Fourth Industrial Revolution conversation. I think it was a fantastic way. The one thing I would add to that is that it's a conversation around a power shift. And I think what's foundational and really important to remember is about inclusion and bringing every individual into um, the conversation and making sure that there's relevant and important uh, decisions that everybody uh, can be included in and can make. One of the things I think that often gets lost, too, is that what we're really looking at is just, I'll call it a long tail opportunity. People are connected, they have a voice, and it's up to those that are leading institutions and organizations to more effectively find a way uh, to meet those needs, to address that demand, and find ways that we can build and broker new relationships. Um, we did a video a couple of years ago, too, that um, actually predates uh, the label of the fourth industrial revolution, but it also starts to tee up some of the ideas and notions just in terms of how um, the, the challenges are being presented to us. So if we could roll the video, that'd be great. Our world is changing, driven by the increasing value of big data and you. I'm not sure if it's working, okay. Well, there was a nice guy with a British accent and he uses a lot of big words and there's some pretty pictures and more or less, so it's like this. Our world is changing, driven by the increasing value of big data and ubiquitous connectivity. The velocity, complexity, and transparency of today's world is unprecedented. Everyone and everything is linked creating a fabric of complex relationships between people, institutions, and societies. As these relationships evolve, they create both opportunities and risks. Balancing them is a challenge in our constantly changing world. To achieve this balance, we need approaches fit for the world we live in. Our institutions were not designed to handle ambiguity. Our decision-making tools were built for a simpler world. There are no easy answers. There are no quick fixes. The questions arise, in the era of big data, can we build the world we want? Can we unlock new socioeconomic value and growth for all? 
Can we address increasing risks? Can we hold each other accountable? Despite this uncertainty, clarity is beginning to emerge. A starting point is the individual. With individuals at the center, ecosystems can evolve with greater trust, transparency, and accountability. They are more resilient, innovative, and equitable. Yet building an approach around individuals requires a shift in thinking. It requires an approach that seeks to continually balance competing perspectives versus defining static solutions. Our focus needs to be on managing the context in which data is used rather than preemptively controlling specific data types. We need to find new ways to effectively engage individuals. We need an underlying set of new technologies and enhanced legal frameworks to enable the trusted flow of data. With this new approach, principles-based approaches can evolve which are more flexible, adaptive, and that dynamically balance risks and opportunities at the individual, institutional, and societal level. As the boundaries between the physical and digital worlds collide, and billions of people, processes, and things interconnect, understanding the impact of using data is now a global priority. By collectively striving for balance in the ways that big data is used, we can unlock its tremendous potential to build value, enhance lives, and address critical global challenges. Great. So I think what that video says is all the various dependencies and challenges, that this is not a problem to be fixed. These are dilemmas that we need to manage and work through on a, on a daily basis. And just to pivot a bit more towards the fourth industrial revolution. So once again, we've all seen the larger pictures. This is probably a little hard to read, but basically what you have here is just a way that if you flesh out some of the different technologies that have been used in the different revolutions. The thing that I think is important to get across is that actually the fourth industrial revolution might be, buzzword coming, apologies, um, post-digital in the sense of we're not really worried about the electricity in this room, right? That's just become in the background. We just assume it's there. In many ways, we just start to assume that the digital capabilities uh, will be there. It's how they all interconnect and support one another and create new innovation. And so I think just in terms of a framing concept, if you just think of interconnections and how various things can all be synthesized together uh, might be an interesting way just to frame the difference of what's coming versus the changes that we've been at for you know, decades now in what I'll call the digital space. And in terms of the specifics, I think uh, has been pointed out in a number of ways, there's some core enablers that I feel are very important that we can uh, start to frame. Uh, obviously, AI and its ability to automate a variety of different processes and autonomous vehicles being one as a core foundational uh, enabler, the Internet of Things as far as you know, literally every item being quote unquote cognified and being intelligent, and obviously that's gonna be a, a long path, but I think that's another element that we'll all need to look at. Uh, 3D printing, uh, not only of physical objects, but biological and, and other forms as well. You can um, you know, press a button and create your food, <laughs> I think is a very interesting element. And CRISPR, and all the various elements that are coming through genomic editing, I think is another class of technologies that are important to look at. And then lastly, I think one of the interesting combinations is uh, virtual slash augmented reality. I think those are two elements that uh, are um, not necessarily the same, um, but how that can apply to the world of robotics and drones. Uh, particularly in the humanitarian space, I know that some very early stage prototypes, right, are taking drones, putting on an Oculus, and really getting a view over a, a, a disaster response, right? We're really starting to understand how can we leverage those two together. So if you add up all those various things, I think we have a very amazing moment in time, uh, a mesh, right, of different capabilities. And I think there's a variety of ways that you can drill down to any of those topics. And there's a long list of other things. It actually was really pretty tough to start to edit it. But I think beyond just what it is, it's how they behave is something that I think we need to more fully embrace. And this is the notion of when all these things interconnect, you have complex systems, right? And complex systems, when you dive into that literature a little bit, have certain behaviors that are more or less universal, that keep you know, repeating themselves. One obviously being the velocity, 
right? And we can see that everywhere. We can see just the speed of how things are approaching the nonlinear growth. And I think one of the key things to keep in mind is that we're not all functioning at the same speed. And so in terms of a coping mechanism in ways that you can start to manage you know, as leaders, it's just the recognition of we have different clock speeds. And then if we look for the sync points for when certain processes are operating at a certain speed, and yes, they might be getting faster, but there's other elements that just go much, much faster. When and where can we find points when, if you will, the red dots all line up and things are working in time, right? If you think of a, you know, a musical round, right? If we all started to sing row, row, row your boat, right? At different points, at certain points, we all hit the downbeat. And I think that's one of the things to keep in mind when we recognize the accelerating velocity is that we're at different velocities. And I think that's also where some of the confusion parts. So, you know, look for the downbeat. Look for that point where we can all intersect. The second notion is around the emergence, right? That nobody is in control of these systems that we build. There's illusions of control, but I think it, you know, you only have to read the paper of just how quickly things can change. Um, you know, it's the butterfly effect. One small little um, influence, the initial conditions can be critical for how things emerge. So I think from a leadership perspective, particularly at the senior level, of just recognizing it's about the agility, the adaptation, the changes that can occur um, without anybody's you know, really strong orchestration is something that we just need to more fully embrace. And so this emergence is another element of the fourth industrial revolution that I think uh, hits at the heart right, of, of the tension. Right? Nobody's in control. And so how do we functionally adapt and, and coalesce and work to goals that we want? And then lastly, it's this notion of power. And this is maybe a bit wonky, and I know I'm in some deep waters over my head. But it's the notion of when you have a highly connected system, certain nodes, certain um, entities are more densely connected than others. Um, as an example, if you looked at two maps of the United States, one looking at the highway system, right, and you would see almost every city has roughly, give or take, the same amount of highways that ring the city that go in and out. You know, there wouldn't be that much difference between Atlanta, New Orleans, St. Louis, whatever, you know. There's all cities roughly have the same amount of uh, highways. But if you look at an airline map, right, which is a network system, Atlanta, New York, Chicago, LA, Amsterdam, you can find a few others, Paris, are densely interconnected. Right? And those nodes help guide and relate and allow you to get to different places. That's a network system. And it's just a reality, right, that certain elements are more densely connected. And that's a small subset. And those nodes also are powerful, right? Atlanta goes down or, you know, any hub city, there's a snowstorm in Chicago. We all see the second order impacts of what it means when those densely connected nodes go down. And we see that being replicated in the commercial sense. Right? There's seven large commercial entities that have extraordinary powers in how entities and individuals interconnect. Right? Microsoft's one, but Amazon, Google, Facebook. And I think one of the elements that we need to recognize is that's probably just a foundational truth right, of a densely connected system. That there's this kind of scale-free, disproportionate allocation of these powerful interconnected webs. And that when you look at from a public-private perspective, those powers, particularly in the way that they can use data to see into the future, right, the analytics allow them to you know, view ahead and predict, uh, is different than public sector, than governments. And so one of the ideas that's coming across is that commercial entities uh, understand individuals uh, from a, uh, what you could call a visibility perspective, right? Uh, our wireless carriers see us as consumers that are going to pay their bills, right? We're visible in that market sense. Uh, a government would look at us as being legible, you know? How many people here are registered to vote, right? That is, could be a subsample of people. And so this tension between visibility of the private sector and legibility of the governments, but both entities are mandated, if you will, to look at everybody, creates some tension. Right, because not everybody is legible, but many, many more people are visible. And so when a government needs to act on its behalf, there's some tension of, ah, wait a second, you've got a much better control, or at least better understanding, right, of how people work and interact. So we could spend a lot of time looking at this notion of power, but I think just in terms of insights and frames and some of the tensions that to me are continually coming up, 
that power is no longer evenly distributed, right? It's concentrated amongst a few people, and how we start to manage and address that is one of our challenges going forward. So in terms of just wrapping up the uh, uh, fourth industrial revolution in terms of the conversations we're having, you know, I think this notion of how is the world changing, what are some of the relationships between stakeholders, public, private, civil society, the ability of individuals to engage, uh, what are some of the new efficiencies? What are ways that businesses and anybody can leverage all this connected uh, fabric, if you will, to deliver services more effectively? Um, and I think ultimately, uh, this question of how should we be innovating? With so many different ways to interconnect and discover and learn, we have unlimited potential to create new things. And so yes, we can be highly efficient. In many ways, that's where the automation will come in. It's much more efficient many times for the machines and the robots to actually uh, deliver those efficiencies. But as a community, we can also be innovating and discovering new ways to move forward on a daily basis. And then lastly, it's around the policies too. I think one of the elements that there are some, uh, call it differences in clock speeds and where there's some um, work that I think that needs to, uh, bridges need to be built um, is between uh, the policymakers and the tech community. Um, you hear this many times, you know, particularly from the tech community, that the tech's not the problem, it's the rules that govern it is where we get some frictions and understanding. And I think if you spend time listening to both sides, the goals are the same, it's just that we're just a, um, to borrow a phrase, a, di a digital and data literacy challenge on both sides to how can we more effectively understand the needs of one another. So what I'd like to do now is pivot a little bit to how those uh, questions have been framed through the eyes of enterprises. Uh, over the last two years, we've interviewed oh, close to 200 different uh, industries across oh, um, many different geographies. We spent a fair amount of time of asking the question, well, what do digital technologies mean to you in your business, and how are you managing that transition? And so the uh, starting point, is a framework, if you will, the lens that in many ways will sound familiar, um, but in terms of how businesses are starting to frame and address uh, the challenges of digital transformation, there is a set of questions from a strategic perspective and then there's a set of questions of how you operationalize and put some of those strategic visions to work. And if you kind of go around the clock, we call it the hexagon, but you know, one of the first starting points of any journey, right, is the vision. And uh, as an institution, what are you doing that starts to shed off some of the things that are maybe supplementary to, supplementary to your core uh, mission? Who are you? What are you really about? And how do you relate within the ecosystem to other entities? So it's that kind of inward looking element in the alignment of what is it that you really want to become? What is your core value proposition? And how do you relate to others? And then from there, it's okay, well, what are the, some of the new approaches and ways that your strategies need to be revisited? Uh, what are some of the new business models? What are some of the ways that you can le leverage platforms um, that are different? And so some of those differences that are coming through in the conversations is that uh, really starting to uh, you know, embrace the feedback loops, the relationships with individuals, right? You see that a lot within the retail sector of traditional retail stores becoming retail stories, right? And that the engagement and a lot of the delivery and the services is really done in a virtual world. And the physical is a way that you can bring people together, um, but it's less of that you know, hardcore transaction. Um, there's also a number of different business models of finding your fixed assets and how can you more effectively open those fixed assets up for others to use it, right? That's kind of the heart of the sharing economy. You got a house, you're not there, maybe somebody from Airbnb could pay you for using that. In a business to business context, you start to see a lot of interesting uh, models coming up in the logistics uh, space. You know, trucks, fleets that have spare capacity uh, on a backhaul being able to leverage that more effectively. Uh, medical imagery equipment that simply is not being used around the clock could be opened up for others to use. So this notion of taking fixed assets delinking them from your control and just improving the interactions is very key. And I'll talk a little bit more around the platform strategies, but that's really kind of understanding how can you more effectively as a um, producer uh, meet and reach a very, very long uh, tail of markets? How can you just be more targeted in the way that you deliver services? And vice versa, as a customer, 
how do you kind of leverage the choices that platform gives so that if you have a need that you've got a wide open marketplace from which to choose from. Uh, the third element in terms of just a key strategic element is this notion around governance and how do we more effectively understand rules of the road, how do we manage some of the tough decisions that we need to make, some of these tough dilemmas both internally within an organization but externally you know, outside your four walls. Uh, that's probably a talk in and of itself. I think one of the key takeaways are the incentives internally for organizations to really disrupt themselves. Um, that's an easy glib buzzword to say, disrupt yourself. I think where it really comes um, you know, to bear fruit is when the question of, are we listening to the wrong customers? Right? That's kind of anathema right, to being in business. But in many ways, the transition is that actually the revenue, the income we're gaining from a certain customer uh, embraces all of our quote unquote old world ways of going to business and they're tying our hands. And so that was some of the insights of how do you pivot away from real revenue um, to pivot towards some of these new strategic elements and how do you uh, communicate that to Wall Street is a really, really tough challenge. And so this uh, notion of disrupting yourself in terms of well, what are some ways to implement it typically turns into responses that say, well, spin it off. Don't get caught up in those existing incentive structures. That's going to be a really tough power battle. But when you find the innovation, nurture, and, and supplement that in a separate org structure, but that has the senior leadership and support of the, uh, the C-suite. Uh, the other elements, I'm going to bridge and build into that at the back end of the conversation. But I think one of the key elements is just the reward sharing, right? particularly from a context of just being able to be the big industrial giant, the velvet hammer, so to speak, of saying, here's the deal, take it or leave it, that's really not sustainable. And I think if you look at some of the large incumbents, uh, particularly in the retail space, the nature of how deals are being struck, the partnering elements, just the way that value is being reapportioned is one of the key enablers that I think is different uh, over if you look back you know, 10, 15 years ago. Uh, once again, some of the key insights. Uh, I think one of the key elements that you know, pops through too is this notion of the innovation and how it emerges outside your four walls and that you need to design your organization to really listen better, to go out, not really sure what it is, but to engage in um, you know, innovation hubs or to um, second people to different organizations, possibly to NetHope, but to really get, if you will, sensors and antenna out there to really have a better understanding of what's coming and probably one of the most uh, important questions are, what are our own blind spots? What are the assumptions that we're making that are leading us down the same path? And so how can we more effectively break out some of those uh, echo chambers and some of the, the traps that we continually fall in institutionally to learn and understand how things are working differently? And then the last one, just in terms of a key element, is this notion of pivot, pivoting towards outcome, um, this notion of, if you're simply focused on selling more products versus pivoting towards outcomes, um, that's one of the key, I guess, uh, key ideas that you hear coming from a, a lot of the leading thinkers. Uh, just to give an example, in the ag space, uh, some of the large ag providers are, instead of selling seeds and fertilizer, starting to focus on commitments to deliver certain crop yields. Uh, if you look in the health space, right, that this is um, not necessarily selling you a pill, but keeping you out of the doctor's office, right? Keeping you healthy. Um, even in the automotive space, right? You see certain, um, even component manufacturers saying, well, we're not gonna sell you tires, right? We're just going to sell you runtime, right? We're, we're going to guarantee that you never get a flat. And so we'll be continually repairing. So this pivot to, instead of um, products to services, I think is another uh, core strategic insight that a lot of businesses are now starting to wake up to and that they're driving outcomes and probably most importantly shared metrics that everyone agrees on so that collectively you can drive those outcomes. The notion of platforms is one of the ways too that I think uh, is a term that gets tossed around a lot, it's a bit confusing and I think it's something that I think uh, is the way that the digital marketplace will evolve. Um, one of the things that historically platforms have been viewed at, right? You, it's a term that's been around for 20 years in the tech space, is very much at the infrastructure level, right? It's the complicated ways that parts interconnect and work together in a very reliable, high-performing and secure manner, but it's really at the end of the day just making sure that the gears of a uh, machine, you know, the, the gears in a watch, right, uh, can work together in a very modular fashion. 
What's happening now, now that everyone has a phone, or roughly everyone has a phone, and that is the interaction space where the coordination, where the trust, where the knowledge, where the reputation, where the currencies can flow. And so a lot of the uncertainty and a lot of the innovation is happening at the interaction space. And I think, you know, just as an entity, NetHope might be a very uh, interesting organization you know, that, that would understand uh, the interaction space, right? The, the humanitarian crisis, the way that uh, different organizations relate, the way that needs are met, the way that communities are served, isn't really about the infrastructure, right? Those services that can be bought and sold from one another, but how are you going to coordinate and act in, with trust and accountability? And those are areas that we need to more effectively understand. I think another way to kind of look at this two dilemma is, or two elements is that the infrastructure is really a complicated problem, right? That's similar to the brakes on your car. They need to be you know, very reliable. They need to you know, stop every time you put your foot in the brake. But at the interaction space, that's a challenge around complexity. And that's less about the, uh, the machine working reliably, but it's how I drive to work every day. And every time you drive, it's a different um, set of behaviors, right? That's social coordination. And I think the key difference is when you see a red light, that's an individual human decision to pick your foot up and put it on the brake, right? And so that's social coordination that we all agree on the norms and the rules and we all see the consequences of going through a red light. And what I think what makes the humanitarian context particularly interesting is that this group might actually be the exigent circumstances, right? when you're an ambulance going through a red light. And so what are the signals, the codes, the ways we need to interoperate to say, hang on, at this moment, in this time, in this particular crisis, if you're driving a car, put your foot on the brake when you see a green light because there's another entity, there's a higher priority. We need to adjust how we interoperate. So I think one of the key takeaways is there's complicated problems and there's complex problems and the complex problems are really about our social norms and interactions and our legal structures for how we agree to hold each other accountable. I'm gonna skip this slide real quickly, just in the interest of time, but essentially it kind of unpacks the notion of what a platform is. On one hand, you've got supplies, suppliers, and on one hand, you've got users, and you've got orchestrators, right? So if you think of YouTube, you know, you've got people producing videos, and you've got people watching videos, and there's an entity at the top that makes sure that the videos you want can be easily found and, and discovered. I think one of the cool things that's different about platforms is that an individual organization can flip-flop on both sides, right? You can watch a ton of videos, and you can also be a producer, right? You could be a, you know, a YouTube star. And so being able to toggle back and forth, as well as if you wanted to be an orchestrator, is really some unique skills, and I think particularly when you look at a disaster response context, right, individuals are both demand-based, right, there's services and interventions that need to be made, but they're also producers, right, all of the crowdsourcing, the, the local uh, inputs that you can get. So I think just as a frame, I think there's a lot of value in starting to frame some of the ways that uh, the humanitarian and human rights and, you know, the development space could look forward is understanding these notions of platforms more effectively. Businesses are really starting to wake up. Um, I think the circle in the middle tells a story. There's roughly about 10 to 15% of businesses. This is in a B2B space. This is not including a lot of the B2C spaces. Um, but you don't want to be late to this party. Right? I, don't, I forget the metaphor, but it's, you, know, you don't want to show up to whatever the sporting event is in the fourth quarter and hope to be a, a meaningful player. So I think the key message here is it's now time to start to uh, join in and to really prioritize this focus on platforms. And there's a lot of tensions, right? I think one of the big elements that's coming through is this notion of collusion and competition. There's signals coming out of the FTC and in The Economist of hang on, all this data-driven kind of dynamic pricing uh, could also be called collusion. <laughs> and so there, the metrics, the understandings of how those uh, platforms will work at scale aren't fully understood. There's a lot of tensions around local inclusion, particularly from the EU. Some of the big platform players, you know, you could look at some of the challenges Uber and Airbnb are having are around local compliance and local regulations. And quite simply, these services were designed where local regulation was an externality, right? And that the play was, once you hit scale and once the service got embedded, you'd start to work your way through the legal system to chip away at rules one to another. When you really kind of dive into some of the VC firms and people that are looking at it, that's not necessarily kind of a going forward strategy for a lot of businesses. So more effectively, bringing policymakers and regulators to the table is gonna be a key step forward. And so I think that once again 
it's a really interesting space for the humanitarian space and the development space to start to more effectively design tech and regulators and policies from the beginning and not operate under the assumption, well, this is new stuff, those old rules don't apply to us. Actually, there's a lot of value and norms and harms that need to be addressed. So pivoting a little bit towards the data space and in the specific notion of international development, there's been no shortage of hype over the last five years, and I'll confess to being one of the uh, <laughs> provocateurs of that, of let's raise awareness, let's stimulate people on what the potential is for using data for good. And that could be in the very near term, in kind of crisis situations, or over the long term, over the 15 to 20 year uh, you know, time frame. I think one of the elements that uh, is more effectively needs to be addressed even within that space are that entities and individuals focused on, we need data for 15 days, don't necessarily talk to the people of, we need data for 15 years. And in many instances, the data, the insights that's being captured could be the same bits, right? And so from a collaboration perspective and where insights could be shared, is how can some of the long-term sustainable development goal communities more effectively link into some of the people, the um, emergency crisis responders? Uh, that's not to say that needs to be done blindly. I'll dive into that in a second, but I think that's one area just as a uh, community where there could be some really interesting power. I think like a lot of things in life, uh, this space is challenged by some very significant uh, dimensions, and I'll spare you the, <laughs> the pain of going through all of them. But I think first and foremost are the security risks. One of the strongest messages you hear from people is first, do no harm. And that despite all the magic and power and glory a tech-driven future could give us, we need to know the bright red lines of what not to do first. And if we can understand those harms and then we can frame things more effectively, I think we'll have a better sense. But there's a lot of tech optimism and belief in the future, but I think we also need to recognize that like, hang on, the cost, right? of getting this wrong, there is no reset button, right? And that the redress and using tech in ways that are inappropriate are ways that need to be more fully addressed. In terms of the challenge, right, despite that big spaghetti, you know, plate of just different issues that are facing one another, there's largely been three areas that uh, we've been focused on to frame that conversation. One's on the data deficit, right? You cut the world in half, the global north, it's a data deluge. The global south, in general, there's a data shortage. Right? There's billions of people that don't have an identity. There are just lack of data sets. There's just a need to go out, measure this community, probably if anybody really understands the, the concerns around the data deficit. So how do we build those bri bridges? And I think uh, one of the areas that we've been focused on between public sector, civil society, and private sector. There is a lot of data being generated in the global south by private sector but it's some challenges to get to that. Uh, the notion of governance. How do we more effectively leverage risk-based approaches so that we can use data, but in a way that's contextually rich, it's relevant, it's trustworthy, and that it's, it's bound, right, for a specific context and doesn't have this uh, kind of uh, unmanageable risk. <laughs> and lastly, it's around the empowerment. How do we more effectively design the tools and the approaches for individuals so that they have a say. Uh, one thing I think you can safely say over the first 20 years of the web is that we've all roughly ended up on the wrong side of a one-way mirror, right? The people that collect and use data as we serve are designed, right, the economics to roughly keep us in the dark for all the various ways that it's used and monetized. That's fine. We've all clicked I agree, right? But I think there's also a little bit of uh, concerns that going forward, the next 20 years of the internet doesn't need to be based around those same power relationships, right? Individuals could have a more effective voice and say and insights on how data buying about them is being used. And I'll give another shout out to our friends at Microsoft. They've been leading that charge for I think five or six years as far as what that empowerment inclusion could mean in terms of real change. So in terms of the data deficit, I think there is a huge set of entangled risks. And you can read this, I'll be happy to walk you through, but from the geopolitical, the government, the commercial, the security risk, there's no shortage of reasons for a private sector to not share data. 
Uh, the open data works in a government context, but just simply telling a CEO you need to open your data is a non-starter for probably six more reasons as well. So we need to build some approaches and some ways that the specific use of the data can be de-risked and that you can more, more effectively dive into this. But this kind of general notion of private sector data needs to be open, trust me, for the last five years, that's been a really tough windmill to till out. So I think in terms of chipping away at that, if we look at there are certain data processes that uh, get optimized, these are known questions, these are known results, just the way you operate, we just need more data that's faster, cheaper, better, right? And we're getting that, right? I think the challenge there is information management, how do you use that data to get the results that you need in your day-to-day -day operation? There's also the need for the discovery, to get the data scientists literally in a test kitchen, right, with airlock doors and white robes and everything, to experiment, to learn and use the data, that's a different value prop. And in many ways, some of the leading education institutions at Harvard and MIT have done that, but we need to more formally recognize that we need these labs, right? And that kind of test kitchen metaphor also means that the first people that get tested, it doesn't get shipped out, you know, to the world, only a few people, right, would get to use an experiment. And then the third level is, okay, we figured out some new models. We figured out some new approaches. We've got some innovative questions. We discovered questions we never knew to ask before, and now we need some new data sets. And how do we access that? And I think that's a big pivot. I think that's one we're starting to nurture, is that the data doesn't need to be open, but the APIs do. If you had a known question, right, that's an auditable and true and fair algorithm, it can query a variety of different private sector data sets, and that's quite frankly how a lot of business gets done today. So if we can start to embrace this notion of using APIs as a way that the questions that can be answered, I think that's some really interesting ways that we can move forward. Uh, there's a pilot that the forum and others have been uh, kind of nurturing. It's called the OPAL Project for Open Algorithms. Happy to talk to you in more detail, but what it is is it's basically building up a certified bank of algorithms, of weather, of population movements, of highly anonymized data that sits behind a private wall, and it gets queried, right? And where the oversight and the governance comes in, are these questions true, fair, accurate, and who's asking the questions, and how are they gonna be used? So it's less about the data, and more about how it's being used. The governance, this notion of privacy, this is a word that I think is probably one of humankind's most conflated and problematic words. Only in the sense of we all recognize it, but we all define it differently. If we did a quick poll, we'd all come up with different differences. And so one quick way, and this is kind of diving into literature, is if we can unpack the specific harms around privacy and recognizing that there's harms around surveillance, right? There's harms around aggregating and um, disclosing who you are or backing into quote unquote anonymous data, right? That can be relatively easily, you know, you can find who people are uh, through the um, mosaic effect. Telling secrets about one another, disseminating information, uh, just being intrusive, right? The peeping time. There's a whole set of different harms. And so when you use the word privacy, try and get past that and speak to what are some of the specific harms, right, that are being implemented. There's a variety of other elements that are starting to drive this lack of trust in data. The legal uncertainty, some of the technical weaknesses, just the institutional norms, eh, you know, we'll, we'll get by. We, you know, we've got some trade-offs to make. Uh, the kind of lack of stewardship and, and ownership of it. And lastly, some of the commercial incentives, right? The economics that are building the data economy are about forward transfer. You know, this is a non-rival risk good. I can copy it infinitely. And if people will pay me for a copy of this data, I can make some money off of it. And so that's basically how the economics have been fueled. And so we need a different model for how the data can be more effectively used and leveraged. I'm going to skip through some of these slides real quickly. But basically, one of the elements that's important is if you start to adopt a risk-based approach for using data, which is to concretely identify what the types of harms that you're looking at at multiple levels. So you've got harms at the individual level we could all feel. You've got harms at the community level, which quite frankly in a development context is the primary class of harm, right? It, it's what happens at the community level, at gender level, at ethnic bias. And so what the concern is that we get all caught up around privacy, but it's discrimination and racial bias, which is probably the most severe and likely harm to happen once you know, this sector moves into it. So that to me is, is a big concern. In terms of framework, 
This is relatively 1990s risk assessment approaches. I'm sure that you know, if you get some people in there, we can start to up the game here. But in general, if you just look at it first, identify your impact, identify your risk exposure, take action, then balance, rinse and repeat. Those are some of the key elements of pragmatically what you can do around data. There's a lot of upsides and downsides to using data at multiple scale. Real quickly, these notions of the harms can change at different phases in the uh, value chain. So not only do you have a variety of different risks in terms of the scale, you have them at different points in the collection, storage, processing, and dissemination of data. And these kind of things below just start to unpack the various harms you're going to have in terms of just privacy, right? I haven't even touched discrimination. So this is a complicated problem, right? But frameworks, taxonomies, and understanding it, I think, is going to be a way forward so that we can really understand what the specific likely and severe harms are versus being navigated by fear, which is just kind of unrational anxiety. Um, this last one around the empowerment of individuals is probably the most important one, and I probably babbled too much at the front end and should have devoted more time to this one. Um, this, too, is one of the truth to power elements, and right now, one of the biggest concerns is that we don't really understand individuals' concerns around data, particularly the most vulnerable. And so the research, the, the time spent out in the field, there's, is anybody from Internews here? I'm not sure if you've seen the tremendous work in understanding local in information ecosystems, the trust, the influence, and what do pa people need, and how can data be used to address that? And so the big pivot from the empowerment is we can't look at data as a means in and of itself, right? It's a step, it's a tool, but ultimately we need to understand and really start to more effectively bring those voices as we divine, de design solutions. So I think the other element, too, is that in the notion of the data that's being uh, created, uh, there's stuff we all create. We talk about this speech, right? It, me, I know I'm giving it, the forms you fill out. What's also growing in terms of the volume is stuff we're not really that aware of, right? There's tons of data being collected right now just from the security monitors, our phones, in a variety of ways that none of us is really aware of but could be very used to tag you, right? And we haven't even gotten to the Internet of Things. So the growth of observational data that people aren't aware of is another domain of kind of inquiry that as a community we need to focus on because quite simply, it's really not about the data you knowingly create. It's all about the inferences that others can understand and infer about you where we need to have a more coherent conversation of saying, well, despite that lack of awareness, here are some principles, here are some approaches we can use going forward. Um, it's this trade-off of it's me, it's mine. So ownership of data is kind of a misnomer too. Ownership is a social construct. I can wave this clicker around and say it's mine, but you all have to recognize it, particularly the people back in the tech booth. And so data, if you will, is, is a commons, right? It's an inert object. There can be control over the access to it, but the ownership is really about us to decide who owns data and in what context. And it's different than a physical good, right, of when a lot of our laws were written when we were talking about, you know, a physical object, right? Because data can be copied infinitely, there's just a whole new set of, of regimes needed. So in summary, I think one of the big things, despite all of the promise and the, the hope of all the various technologies, one of the key things that I think is important, particularly in the context of the fourth industrial revolution, are how well are we listening, right? The needs of the individuals, the most vulnerable, is that one of our top priorities and are we leveraging all these new capabilities to really, really understand you know, what's most important? Um, within that conversation, are we aligning on what we could collectively measure to build the world we want? Right? So we've listened, what are some of the outcomes and how can we more effectively measure those outcomes and then collectively execute against them? And then lastly, there's a lot of innovation, but how well can we use empathy as one of our central points? Right? If you, you know, put on one of the sneakers over your face, the new VR machines, I think one of the coolest videos out there, right, or that can take you to some of the camps um, and see the world through the eyes of individuals. Uh, there's an interesting article in the Times last week that was talking about VR as being an empathy machine. I think that's a hugely powerful concept and something that if we all started to embrace more effectively, that with all the technology and possibilities, it really gave us a perspective to see the world through the eyes of others. That, I think, would be transformational. That would be something that I think we would all be proud 
to live, you know, and say we helped create in uh, the year 2016. So thank you all for your time. Uh, and if there's uh, any questions, I'll be around the rest of the day. And um, thank you again, and congrats to all the great work at NetHope. Thanks, Bill. Um, we're going to segue quickly now to uh, uh, Lauren Woodman, who doesn't really need an introduction. I do have one public service announcement. The NetHope staff will have a small meeting right after, right during the break in the back here. But uh, um, digital transformation is the uh, is the uh, spotlight uh, uh, today. So, Lauren, uh, do you want to put a, a, a bow around it? Yes, uh, I want to uh, put a bow around it. Um, hi, everybody. How many people stayed up last night and watched the Seahawks game? Come on, seriously? My goodness. Um, how many people stayed up last night and um, counted down till it was the last day of this election? All I could think of this morning when I woke up was uh, it, uh, when President Ford um, gave his inauguration address after he took over after the Watergate scandal, his opening line was, our long national nightmare is, almost, is over. Um, and I kept thinking that might be appropriate for today, that this long national nightmare of an election is over. I don't care who you support. I'm tired of the conversation. Um, and I feel very badly for the people who live in the, the battleground states where the, apparently there's been nothing but political ads on for several months. So uh, I'm quite sure that there will be some uh, heated discussions or energetic conversations um, in, the, in the bar this evening. And uh, uh, we will certainly be down there having a conversation around that. I want to thank Mary and Bill um, for teeing up um, and, and really exploring in some depth the impact that we're seeing coming from the changes that are happening that we're collectively calling the fourth industrial revolution. Um, as Mary pointed out, um, there are some tremendous benefits and there are also some risks that we need to think about how to manage. As Bill pointed out, the issues that these changes raise um, are exceptionally complex. And given the speed with which these changes are hitting all of us, and, and the speed with which they are creating opportunities um, for all of us, it is incumbent on us to think about them and, and think about how we engage and, and how we in the NGO sector want to be part of a conversation around how we shape questions of privacy and inclusion and security and so on and so forth. I want to spend some time today, though, thinking, talking, bringing together a number of threads that we've heard over the last couple of days um, around what, where I see some opportunities for us as a sector and where I see some opportunities um, in particular for those of us um, inside the NetHope family, our partners, our, um, our, our member organizations, um, our member organizations, partners, um, it, that broader community, I think, has some tremendous opportunities sitting in front of it, um, given all of the changes that we see happening. I want to start with the notion, though, that we have to start with the idea of change. And everyone's heard the adage that, you know, what got you here won't get you there, right? So there's a, there's, there are fundamental changes happening in the sector around us, um, within our sector, within the technology sector, within the broader economy. And if we sit back and just sort of watch it happen and let it happen, then we might not like the outcome on the other end. And so how do we think about um, what we need to do in order to change, in order to get there, uh, to get where we want to be? Um, this is Charles Darwin. Um, he is often, uh, this quote is often attributed to him. It is not the strongest or the intelli most intelligence of the species that survive, but those that are most adaptable to change. Um, it turns out Darwin didn't actually say that. Um, that was a business professor in the 50s um, who was paraphrasing Darwin. Um, and it got misquoted somewhere, um, including being engraved on uh, the, floor, the marble floor at California State University um, in one of the science buildings where they have since taken off Charles Darwin. They've had to go back and, and buff Charles Darwin's name out of it as it not being attributed to him. Um, it is, of course, what he thought, the whole idea that he posed up. Um, but it was actually, uh, anybody remember the guy's name? Leon, Leon Messenger, Mes Meginger, Megan, something like that, um, who actually said that portion. But the idea behind it is right. We have to change. We have to change. Um, our sector has to change. 
our organizations have to change, and we ourselves have to change. The way we think about the way we approach our work, the way we think about the way we approach our role inside our organizations, um, we've got to adapt to the changes that are, that are happening. So I want to spend a little bit of time um, just kind of summarizing some changes that I see happening. Um, it, it, in the, in the nonprofit sector, in the international development sector, um, there's probably four big buckets of changes. One is scale and complexity, right? The problems that we face are simply getting harder, they're getting more complicated, there are more actors involved in creating and solving those problems, um, and I thought it was instructive yesterday that Jonathan Reckford's comment was, please fix the complexity. Now he was thinking about complexity on the solution side, but the idea that we're all struggling with this notion of complexity, I think, is one that hits us on both sides, both in terms of the problems that we're trying to solve and in terms of the, the solutions um, that we, we try to bring to those problems. Two, it, even, as those, even as those issues become more complex and even as they scale, there aren't equivalent increases in resources that are available to them. I mean, it was, that panel yesterday was great. They essentially gave me all the data I needed. Michelle Nunn's comment was, I don't see resources increasing in any meaningful way in the future, right? It's just not happening. There's, there's, there's no way, you know, to, to, to keep it a linear, in a linear way to keep putting enough resources behind to meet all of the problems um, that we will continue to, fa to face. The participants in our sector are changing rapidly. For long established NGOs, it, I am sure if the, the folks that, that started CARE many, many years ago or started Habitat many, many years ago, although I, I realize the Carters are just down the street, but you know, could come in and take a look at the sector around. The number of participants in the sector and the way that they, they act and how they're shaped and how they're formed would probably be quite different than what they had expected. You know, whether it's, it's social enterprise or transitional organizations that stand up for three or four years to solve a particular problem and then go away because th that issue has been addressed, that grant has been exhausted, uh, the donor's no longer interested, whatever the case may be. All of those things affect the partners that we potentially um, work with and the environment in which, in which we work. Um, and then finally, um, donor expectations. Oops, sorry. Um, donor expectations. Um, you, we heard yesterday, donors' expectations are changing. It doesn't mean they're willing to pay for those changes, but the expectations are definitely changing because as we all use technology in our day-to-day -day lives, we expect to use it everywhere else. And every one of us has had a conversation with someone who said, why can't we just use our iPhones? Gosh, you know, they, this, this works great for me. Why wouldn't it work well in this situation? And we know that, that the complexity that underlies that is not, um, is not always exactly what we need in solving these problems. Every industry has been disrupted. I don't know a better word than disrupted. I agree with Bill that it's a, um, a, a somewhat overused and ill-defined term, but I don't know a better word. But every industry has been disrupted. And we've all seen the slides that, you know, that the world's largest telecom company is Skype, the world's largest entertainment company is Netflix or Xbox or PlayStation, you know, the, the largest lodging company in the world doesn't own a single hotel, the largest taxi company in the world doesn't own a single car. Right? All, all of those platitudes are true because every industry, by and large, has been, disruption, has been disrupted or they're worried about it. The question is, is what's going on? Like, what's actually happening? What's happening that's causing that kind of churn? It's not just interesting technologies, right? There's been lots of interesting technologies for a very long time. So what's really happening that's driving that? Mark Andreessen argued that software is eating the world. Anybody know who Mark Andreessen is? Yeah, great, okay. Um, Mark Andreessen argued that, that software is eating the world, and he's right. Because if you look back at every one of those companies, they, they get to achieve scale very, very quickly because software allows them to do that. And the hardware to run it on is cheap and ubiquitous. Right, and so this idea that, that, that software, and really all, any, any application of technology that you wanna think about, can fundamentally change the, the structures in the sectors in which we all work, in which our partners work, can fundamentally change those, um, change those market structures is something we probably need to pay attention to, right? Probably something we need to do a little bit of thinking about. So a lot of folks have thought about this. 
And there is widespread acceptance that disruption is happening. Um, it, uh, HFS Research did a, 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 um, a study earlier this year, and 100% of CEOs that they asked, they, they asked give or take some change, 2,500 CEOs, 100% of CEOs said disruption was happening in their sector. So I think we can, we can, we can argue that that is an overwhelming majority of folks are, that are concerned, right? 72% of CEOs, and this one came out of PwC, argue that the next three years in their sectors will be more important than the last 50. So when Bill talked about the, the, the speed of change and how rapidly things are changing, it is that sense of urgency, that sense that things are getting away from us, that sense that things are happening so quickly that the next three years are going to be fundamentally important to the worlds in which we work. Now, I don't know if the, the speed is actually increasing, or if it's just that technology touches so many things, and therefore we see speed in, in, in lots of different places that the perception is that the speed is different. But whatever it is, there is a real sense of urgency out there. What's interesting is that widespread acceptance doesn't necessarily extend to our sector. And where 100% of private sector CEOs that were surveyed think that disruption is happening, um, only 52% of nonprofit CEOs think that disruption is happening in their sector. That scares me. That's really, really scary. Because it's not like it was 100% and 97% and we were within the margin of error. We're really far off. And so the question then is, is well, is there something unique about what happens in our sector? Right? Are we next or are we different? So I started looking into that question. And there's lots of people who've done um, lots and lots of research um, around which sectors are vulnerable to disruption and which ones are not. You have a low risk of disruption if there are high barriers to entry and there are few options to digitize anywhere along your value chain, the way you do your operations, the way you deliver your services. So think about it for a second. Do we think there are low barriers to entry in the nonprofit sector? There was a guy up here yesterday, Jake, I think his name was, who didn't know what a server was. Now, I'm pretty sure he knows what a server was. But he said, you know, we, we, we run our business on a credit card. That's not a big barrier to entry. So that one doesn't, that one doesn't exist. There are few options for digitization. I, given the number of ICT for D conferences that exist out there, I've got to believe that there are lots of opportunities for digitization. And certainly those of us that look at the infrastructure and the way that we optimize and, and how we drive efficiency in that value chain, there are opportunities for digitization. There's a high risk of disruption. Things get, the, the, we get a little more specific in terms of how we think about there's a high risk of disruption. If we look at a couple of other more detailed elements, you know, are the cost of bringing technology in relatively low relative to the impact of the customer? And what I mean by that is, is the customer experience going to be negatively impacted if, you, if, we bring in technology, <clears throat> if we bring in technology differently than we currently do it? How many folks think that the communities that we serve, the beneficiaries that we would serve, would be negatively impacted if we brought technology in? None. It might be better served. It, are there inconvenient or, or inflexible um, in processes that our customers deal with. Anybody ever think the US government or the British government or the EU is inflexible or has slow processes? Maybe just a little bit. Um, anybody think that sometimes we ourselves have slow processes? I'm sure we never do that. Um, so there's a high risk, you know, there's a, the, um, I don't know how to pronounce it, I-N-S-E-A-D. It's a European research organization. Is it INSEAD? Is that how you pronounce it? Um, this is their model. Um, and it's really interesting, actually, if you go up and read the, the research they did. They've, they've gone through and looked at, um, at lots of different industries and sort of pulled these out. This is the McKinsey model um, in terms of you know, where there's a high risk for disruption. It's essentially the same. But I think the second one is interesting, that revenue streams are opaque or poorly understood. Right? Where revenue streams are, are, are not well understood by folks on the outside, and that desire for transparency 
especially when you're talking about taxpayer dollars or publicly funded dollars, there's going to be a desire to figure stuff out. And, and I think it's safe to say that nonprofit financing um, is about as opaque as it gets, right? So there's an opportunity there uh, to disrupt. And, and these two criteria come out of the Harvard Business Review. Are there, there are low barriers to entry? That's obviously be, been pretty consistent. And are there large legacy business models that drive the majority of the revenue in the sector? And since most of our business models haven't changed in the, in the last, well, ever, um, I think it's safe to say that we've got some legacy business models um, that are driving the majority of our revenue. So the risk for us is high. And so the question is, is how do we respond? Right? Um, I thought about just walking off the stage now and being like, oh, woe is me. Good luck. Everybody have a great time. Um, that seems unfair. Um, so how do we respond? Um, because I don't actually think it's all doom and gloom. Um, I think there is an opportunity for us to self-disrupt. And again, I agree with Bill. I hate this word, but I don't know a better word. Right? How do you disrupt yourself? Disrupt yourself or die. There are lots of great logos from about seven or eight years ago. Every slide at every IT conference out there, so you can go look at them. And uh, I couldn't find one that felt appropriate. But I think we have to do it in context. I think we have to do it in context and say, what's actually right for us? Right? We are the nonprofit sector. We, we, are, we, are, we are different. We're different because we work in hard places. We deal with hard problems. We work with um, marginalized communities. We have unique challenges in our sector. So if we're going to go out and, 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 and take a torch to our, our, our business models, let's make sure that we do it in a way that when we come out on the other end, it, it actually serves our purpose. So a couple of things around a, things that I think are particularly unique about our sector or uh, the way that I think we ought to think about this, that we should shape that. One of the things that I think is true, and you certainly heard it in Jeannie Ross's conversation yesterday, is there, the ubiquity of technology, the low cost of technology, has led to engaged constituents everywhere. Everybody's got a cell phone. Right? And, and what's, what it's resulted in is Uber. How many people get frustrated if you can't do something on your cell phone these days? Right? Remember when it, was excited when, we, when it was exciting when we could do something new on our phones? And now if you can't get it done, it's, all, it's frustrating as it can be. Right? I get so frustrated that the United app you know, doesn't let me check um, flight status, whereas Delta doesn't let me buy on my phone. I realize it does on an iPhone, but I still haven't made the jump to an iPhone. And when I do, I, can, I too can have that service. But everybody's got a cell phone, and we have certain expectations around that. And it turns out it's not just folks in the developed world. Right? It, it, it's everyone. And, and, and as those price points continue to go lower and lower and lower, we know that everybody's going to have one. So we've got to think about what does it mean to have engaged constituents. And we've, all, we've seen it happen not only in the sector, but certainly in the conversations inside this organization in terms of what does it mean to engage with your constituents in a way where you are co-creating solutions that support the development of the communities in which we work. That fundamentally changes the way that we think about our own work. But it happens because we've got engaged constituents that we can work with. The ubiquity of data. We should probably play data bingo next year. And every time somebody says the word data, you get a quarter or something. Like we, should, we, could, we could make this happen. But I think it's, it, the ubiquity of data, while it is an, over, an overused phrase, it is something we are all struggling with. As Jeannie said yesterday, you know, data is either going to kill you or, or lead to your success. It's one of the two. The good news about data is it can lead to better insights and better response. It can. Uh, set expectations for greater impact, both within our organizations and within our partners. But it also fundamentally changes the way that our hierarchy, our traditionally hierarchical or decision making um, it get, gets done inside the sector. If, if empowered folks all throughout the organization can challenge the, <laughs> the long held belief of the people who know the answer, that, that makes decision making fundamentally different. And if data is out there all over the place, and, and you can be part of that conversation, even if you weren't invited, and I don't mean you personally, but your constituents and communities in which we work, then doesn't that change the way we think about how decisions get made? And doesn't that change the way that we think about the way our organizations work and the way we work with one another? There's also 
a real reality around shifting economics. And I don't really mean the, the economics in terms of, of dollars and cents, but really the economics in terms of the dynamics of the sector. So I want to take a little bit um, of time and, and, and talk through this for a second. And this is the third, the third ish. Um, we're in the fourth industrial revolution, which is the third wave of disruption in the uh, in the in the digital era. Um, we could probably make some very complicated outlines, which would be kind of a lot of fun. But if you think about the way that disruption has happened since technology became um, increasingly ubiquitous, um, the first wave was all about the deconstruction of the value chain and about scaling content and services broadly. Right, so think about when the web came up, all of a sudden you could, you could distribute content and services and, and value on the web to lots of people at very low cost. Right, and then you could use the, that, that free content that could reach great scale to disrupt other business models. The best example of that is when um, Microsoft started selling uh, PCs with the Encarta CD and in the, in the Encyclopedia Britannica went out of business. Right, it just, it just totally disrupted that model because the content allowed us to do something um, new and different um, and to leverage one business to disrupt another um, by creating a, a product that was uh, more attractive than it would have been without that additional now low cost asset. The second wave came when we stopped looking at, at, at the, just the breakup of the value chain and we actually started um, looking at how we get greater economies of scale through the collection of lots and lots of little pieces. Think Wikipedia, right? When, 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 when Encarta went away, and it wasn't coincidental, but you know, Wikipedia is a, tremendous, is a tremendous asset made by a lot of people doing a little bit of work, right? Facebook, the value of Facebook um, you know, is that there's lots and lots of people on there. You can find your high school prom date, right? Because someone, you can chase all the little pieces that are all the way through that. The value of Amazon, I remember, I forget the statistic, but it's something like 75 or 80 percent of people who buy something online go read the reviews on Amazon before they buy anything, even if they don't buy it on Amazon. And, and that whole value chain of, of being able to check something and, you know, get reviews on it is because lots and lots of people have written three paragraphs about this shampoo or that book or those boots or, you know, this spoon or whatever the case may be, and that has dramatically enhanced the value of the platform itself upon which Amazon is built. And so all of a sudden you got lots and lots of little things adding up to lots and lots of big things. Right? It, was the, it was the era of the beauty of the small. Right? The little things all added up to the big things. We're shifting that now. Um, and, and the result, as, we've, <laughs> as more and more of those little things have been built on top of platforms, you, the value of the platform itself now right, is, is really where there is core value. And, and because so many people have migrated to certain, um, to certain platforms, those platforms have gotten so big and so huge that they are virtually impossible to go break down. They're certainly not impossible for an organization, you know, a, a nonprofit organization, to go and disrupt, you know, Amazon Web Services or Azure or Facebook. Think about the, the investment that would be required up front to do that, right? The vision that would be required up front to go do that. It's just not going to happen. So we start building on top of those platforms, right? That's where the differentiation starts happening. And that's where I think there's a really interesting opportunity for us. If you think about infrastructure, just the core infrastructure that's out there, you know, that's a, that is essentially a very, um, that's a, that is a core level that isn't one that sees rapid innovation. There's certainly changes that are happening, but infrastructure takes a long time to change out, right? That takes some time. And, and, it, and it's not something that most individual organizations do. The next layer up, these platforms upon which um, things are now being built are, are becoming the level at which we are all now beginning to build on top of, right? We, we're not going to go recreate these without a really significant um, disruption in a very expensive place for, for another organization to come in and do it. You know, big organizations can go and fight at that level all day long. You know, NetHope, even with all of its members, we're not going to go disrupt that. The innovation and the interesting things, um, you know, start to happen at the top. Because the economies of mass essentially prevent disruption at, at that platform layer, um, but they do allow us the opportunity to differentiate and build value at 
at the upper layers. And that's really, really important because if you go back and look at every one of these companies, it's because of the connections that they had outside of their core operating systems where that value came from. How many folks have ever bought an airplane ticket on Expedia? Right? Yeah, everybody knows Expedia, hotel room, something. All of that interconnection happens because of APIs. You heard Bill talk about the APIs. We all know what an API is. But the API economy and what that is driving now, and it is the, it is the, the connections and the value of those connections where, where, where organizations, where companies are innovating in their business models and where they are extracting value from the market. Expedia makes 90% of its revenue from APIs. Right? I always thought they made revenue from selling airline tickets. Right? Turns out they don't. They make their revenues by passing through the process of buying an airline ticket. The credit card processing companies, that, they make that money because they, they make the money through the scaling through. That's exactly what Uber does, right? All these guys, all these guys have done, you're right, Mary, this thing is driving me bonkers, um, is the value is, isn't necessarily coming these days from creating the assets, but learning how to harness and direct somebody else's assets. And that's neat. Because what happens is, is the disruption isn't happening now at the vertical layer in that value chain. The disruption's happening at the horizontal layer. And that's where those connections can be built and the differentiation can be built. And if you think about organizations that have to work together in order to achieve an outcome, that's an interesting opportunity. So how do we think about disruption in context? Well, maybe we should start to think about it as evolution. Disruption sounds scary. Disruption sounds bad. Um, and even though, I know 69% of CEOs in the uh, Gartner survey, you may tell I read a lot of research surveys trying to figure out sort of what other people were thinking, um, argue that <laughs> they will spend most of 2017 um, dealing with disruption and driving digital um, transformation inside their, their own organizations. Most of them also um, said that it absolutely terrifies them in terms of the impact that it's going to have on their business, because while 69% of them are going to go take on this question of digital transformation themselves personally, about 60% of them, um, uh, about 60 of them also do not believe that they have the people, the processes, the technology, or the time to dedicate uh, to that process in order to make it successful. The way everybody has responded is with the digital strategy. And as we said yesterday, it's, it's a digital strategy is a word that we've all used for a very long time, which now has a new meaning, um, and is becoming our next version of the business school word, right? But it's important to think about what does that digital strategy mean? Um, and I really like Jeannie's, um, Jeannie's definition, right? That we're ultimately talking about a business strategy that is driven by the capabilities that technology unleashes for us. But we have to think about what the business strategy is, and how is it that we are, we are um, delivering unique value to the, the constituencies and the customers that we serve, recognizing that next week it's going to be different. Right? How do we think about that, and how do we set up a, a scenario in which that um, allows us um, to continue to achieve our missions um, and, and help our organizations achieve it, their strategic goals? So I want to argue a couple of different things. Um, I think we all got this yesterday, right? That at the end of the day, this is about the customer. Now, whether that customer is a donor or a constituent or your partners is a great conversation for organizations to have internally because that will help prioritize what each organization, um, how each organization adopts their own strategy. But the idea that the individual is at the center of this conversation reflects not only that we, this is, we have engaged constituents that we, that we have to engage with and we have to serve their needs, or our donors that we have to serve their needs effectively, but looking at the world through their eyes and how we serve and what that interaction is like is the critical piece that each, each of our organizations has to take on. We have to be agile and adaptive, right? Conditions change. What is data telling us? If the data is telling us that something isn't working, or that we could get greater impact on something else, we have to be able to change to that. We have to be able to respond to that. I know there's lots of, of, of restrictions on that. I, we was having a conversation with one of our members um, recently 
about the disincentives that we often have in working with institutional donors um, in terms of if we know that something isn't working, it, we, would, we would love to be able to go out and change, but grants aren't necessarily written in a way that allows us to go and do that. And so how, how do we change the entire conversation across the entire sector so that we can do more of that? And how do we get more connected and collaborative so that if there's value to be created in the connections and the interactions between organizations at that horizontal layer, to build a web of network services, to build value um, across those horizontal value chains, how do we do that? And because we're net hope and we deal with technology, all of it's powered by SMACIT, which is now my new favorite acronym. For those of you who weren't here yesterday, um, SMACIT is Social, Mobile, Analytics, Cloud, and Internet of Things. Right, so that's our, our, new, our new shorthand um, for the technologies that we, that we think uh, will be transformative. So how do we go do those things? There are a couple of implications, I think, um, for the evolution of the sector and its impact on the way that we think about the work that we do. And I think those, those implications um, happen both at the individual level, at the organizational level, and at the sector level. So at the risk of absolutely blatant plagiarism, uh, I want to talk about the, I stole this from Gartner. Um, so if you, if you want to see the whole thinking behind it, I absolutely stole it from Gartner. Um, but the idea is that as we think about the individual, and I use CIO in here somewhat broadly um, in the sense that if we think about the way that we have perceived our technology functions inside our organizations in the past, we've looked at them as technology, technology Impl uh, implementations, they've been very transactional. You know, a, a particularly sophisticated organization might be getting up in there into that partner level. But very few of our organizations are thinking at a strategic level where we are thinking about these horizontal connections. We are thinking about how do we extract value, not out of getting better, faster, cheaper. That's a race to the bottom, and at some point in time, it, there is no more squeezing to be done. So how do we stop thinking about lowering the, the cost of, stop focusing so much on just lowering the cost of doing business and instead increasing the return on the investments that we've got? And I firmly believe that if you look at these shifts that are happening in the marketplace for a sector that, that works together and where value is being created by those connections, that is an opportunity for us. That is an opportunity for all of us to be able to work together more effectively and create that value. For those of you that, that heard me talk yesterday a little bit about some of the work that we'll be doing around um, uh, technology leadership and building organizational um, capacity within our member organizations, it will largely follow this kind of thinking, right? So we're, we're looking at that trusted ally role there um, and thinking about what does that mean and how do organizations um, support that kind of talent development and how do they absorb and leverage that kind of talent development? And I think that's really important because while we have seen over the last couple of years, you know, a real interest in this idea of a chief digital officer, if you look at, you know, retail and media, which have always been sort of the, the first to get disrupted and the bellwethers of what disruption is likely to look at, the chief digital officer now is completely passe. We don't have one of those anymore. Um, we're back to CIO along with the chief data officer, a chief analytics officer, and a chief growth officer. So it, it doesn't really matter what you call it. The idea is that bringing together a digital strategy ultimately depends on a vision that you can execute against and that requires an entire organization to take a, a fresh look at. That requires someone who, quite frankly, is project managing that piece. There is not a CDO, CIO, CEO, C, insert your favorite letter here, O, that would be able to drive an effective digital strategy without an entire organization getting behind it. But certainly those that understand and can pull the levers in the technology space have a critical role to play, if not lead. And so we'll be spending a lot of time this year and, and frankly over the next couple of years thinking about what does that mean not only leadership at the, at the organizational level, but at the sector level. What does it mean, what do our implications mean, pardon me, for an individual organization? 
Again, blatant plagiarism. If you go out and search PwC digital strategy, McKinsey digital strategy, Accenture digital strategy, BCG digital strategy, HBR digital strategy, they're all essentially the same. Some of them have 10, some of them have seven, some of them have three, but they all essentially say the same things. It's all about the customer experience. Whether that customer is wherever in your organization and wherever your body of work, it's about the customer experience. Two, you have to define and expose those transactional, the, the operational processes so you know where you can automate them and where there are points of intersection. Data has to get integrated into that process, both because it's going to tell you how to make decisions based on actual data, as well as generating data to make future decisions. How do you focus on value and not activities? Right? Is what we're doing good? I don't know. How do we measure? In a world where we are um, shifting the way that we think about things, what are the new KPIs that we bring um, to the table to think about whether or not we're creating value? And how do we build value through others? And that really should say, and with others. Right? Because it, it, it's that interdependence that's going to get us there. And then what does that mean for NetHope? Well, if you look at the opportunities that we have to build connections in between organizations, you, we really have to kind of take that down a level. Maybe not down a level, maybe up a level, depending on how you want to look at it. But we really have to sort of look down at the technology layer, right? The, the actual technologies that will facilitate that kind of interaction. And in order for NetHope members to build connection between NetHope members, and their partners, and their private sector partners, and everyone else, quite frankly, in the broader ecosystem, there, has to be a, there, there are essentially two or three questions that have to be answered. And a critical one is trust. And part of that trust is making sure that we are aligned on what kind of security and data management and data sharing and data protection that we're all going to agree to. And as Bill pointed out in, in his talk, it's not super simple. It's actually quite complicated especially when you're dealing with personally identifiable information. So how do we start thinking about, and for those of you that have been involved already, you know we've already started thinking about, how do we start thinking about the types of security um, best practices and the types of security practices, as the security um, protocols that will actually help us know at some level of certainty what we're dealing with on the other end of a transaction that increasingly is dealt with by software, right? And increasingly isn't you and I sitting down, having a cup of coffee, getting to know one another, feeling good about the transaction, going home and thinking about it, and saying, yes, let's, let's do some business together. What really happens is algorithmic business. It's happening at, the, at, a, at, a, at a speed that does not allow a cup of coffee. And so how do you make sure that you're building in the right protocols? How do we make sure that we're treating data the same way? How do we make sure that we all have the same principles that are guiding the work that we're doing so that that business can help, so that that business can be done. How many folks have been to um, ITT, anyway, if then then, the acronym for if then, if this then that, right? Was ITT something or another.com? Has anybody seen this site? Right. You guys have seen this? Okay. So think about how amazing that is. Right? APIs used to be hard and scary. Um, they are now publicly exposed. So you, when you get a mail in your Gmail account, it will automatically ring you know, Siri, or Siri will call you, or Alexa will do something. I don't know, all of these people have, all of these things have female names, which I find this fascinating. Um, but you know, like these, all of these things happen. If I get a mail from this person, put it in my calendar, and I don't even know, it just shows up. And that's not because I have some amazing administrative assistant who was just proactive. It's because a computer, a computer interaction on a website, who knows where, did that for me by monitoring the services that I have in the cloud. So think about that now sort of exploded out and how we might be able to um, leverage that from a development perspective and the question around what are the rules by which we're going to play by to protect the people that we're trying to serve become critically, critically important. And so at, we at NetHope will start thinking about um, those types of things um, and, and pulling those things out and, and building on the work that members have already done this year around pulling together security um, and data protection standards. Standards is probably the wrong word, but 
for my idea. So I think we have to change. I don't think we get to sit around and wait for someone to tell us what to do next. I don't think we get to sit around, and I'm not saying that we generally do, but I don't think we get to sit around and say, hey, you know, this technology thing, it's, it's really changing very quickly, and it will be interesting to watch what happens. Technology has gotten so integrated into everything that we do. It is so much a part of our lives. The idea that digital is only technology is wrong because it's, it's an entirely different way of thinking about things and about, do, about a different way of doing things. And the reason that we can think about digital and not just IT is because technology is part of everything. It's part of all of the different processes inside our organization. And it turns out when something gets that, bright, that broadly spread, we, we get to kind of put our arms around it and say, how do we make this work for us? How do we make this help us to achieve our missions better so that we can, we can serve the constituents and the communities in which we work more effectively? And I think we have to change because while, especially from the MIT perspective, so much of our work in, in the, over the past eons has been internally focused. How do I make internal processes work better? How do I lower my costs? We are now inherently flipping that. And we're thinking, what does the customer want? What do our external partners want? How do I build connections outside of my organization? How do I look beyond my organization's um, goals itself and find partners and new opportunities for, for me to, to um, leverage for the benefit of my organization? And that's fundamentally different. That's fundamentally different than, than, than the way we've thought about IT for many, many years. And it gives us a new opportunity to have a tremendous impact in the communities in which we work. It is not easy. It's not going to be easy in an individual organization. It is going to be wildly terrifying, right? The disruption in the sector is going to be wildly terrifying. Rapid change is wildly terrifying. Even if it's going to be fun terrifying, it's still going to be scary because we're just not sure what comes out on the other end. But I think it's going to be awesome. And I think it's going to be an incredible opportunity for us to be able to look back and say, had we not been active participants in that change, who knows how it would have turned out? Maybe we wouldn't have the impact that we have today, but because we stepped up and because we did something um, amazing, whether we just do it in our own organizations, our own, our own departments, or if we just encourage people to think bigger because the tools allow us to do so, or if we say, let's really go do this, and we take it by the reins and we run with it, I think we're going to look back and say, that was a moment in time when the technology and the, the, the environment in the market really came together to give us an opportunity for transformational change. And I think, I think it will be really fascinating to see how we all collectively build on a 15-year history of collaboration and cooperation to do that together with our technology partners and with the communities in which we work. So with that, I will simply say thank you for the opportunity to at least be part of the conversation. Thank you for coming uh, this week to have this conversation. Um, and thank you for telling me how wrong I am um, during the break um, and over the course of the next couple of days. Thanks, everybody. OK, a couple quick things before break. You're going to want to hear all this. First of all, I got some clarification about the tech talks at lunch. Um, in order to create a quieter space for those discussions, they are going to be in this room right next door, salons five and six, where some of you have probably been eating breakfast. What you'll need to do is go to the dining room, get your plate of food, and come back up to this space if you want to take um, part in those discussions. There's four tables in there with the signs on them. You can look on your agenda to see what the topics are. Secondly. We want to split you into groups so that you know where you're going to go for your member to member, sorry, member showcase sessions, which is what's next. Um, and we're going to have an A, B, C, and D group. Um, if you are in the last three rows across the room, you are in group A. So keep that in mind. You are in group A. Your fearless leader for this is going to be David Goodman. David, where are you? There's David in the back. OK, so you're all going to follow David. If you are in this section over here, but not in those back three rows, you are group B. And your fearless leader is Jonathan Metzger. Jonathan, where are you?
Jonathan is here. He got my text. He knows he's supposed to lead you. So Jonathan will be your leader. There he is. There he is. If you're in this group right here, but not in the last three rows, your group C. Good. And your fearless leader is going to be Forrest Wilhoit. Forrest. There's Forrest. And if you're in this group, but not in the last three rows, you are group D and Alex Alpert, also in the back of the room, will be your fearless leader. So go to the room number for starting with, with your letter. So if you're group A, you go to room A. If you're group B, you go to room B, et cetera, et cetera. Your leaders know which order you're going to go in. I will say it briefly, but you don't have to remember it because if you follow your leader, you'll get to the right place. After you're in A, you're going to go to B. After you're in B, you're going to go to D. After you're in D, you're going to go to C. And after you're C, you're going to go to A. And basically, you're just following the order of the rooms are around the place. So at the end of the break, which is in 20 minutes at 11 o'clock, please get to your um, starting room. Thank you very much.